please welcome Michael Harrington. Uh, the part of the introduction I liked best was the use of the word young. <laughs> Uh, let me start with a parable from real life. Uh, not too long ago, uh, this country was absolutely transfixed. Life almost stopped by the drama of a little girl in Texas, in Midland, Texas, who had fallen down in a well. And everybody's sympathies were engaged, and that community rallied, and the little girl was saved, and we hear now that perhaps she will not lose the foot, that she'll just lose some toes, and so forth and so on. And how many of you noticed one small fact that was alluded to in the news reports? Her family has no medical care. If it had not been for all of the publicity that was focused on her, that would have been a tragedy that would either have put her in a charity ward or destroyed the finances of her youthful parents. And my parable is this, that we live in a country which is capable of the most incredible sympathy and generosity in reaching out to an individual human being and we live in a country which is the only advanced Western industrial society without national health. That we are capable of collective cruelty and individual generosity in America. And what I hope to do this afternoon in talking about the issue of poverty, and particularly the new issue of poverty, if you will, is to try to at least scandalize you about that contradiction and the hope that eventually our individual generosity might become a communitarian generosity which will reach out not simply to a little girl whose tragedy gets on television but to every little girl and every little boy and every human being in the United States or for that matter in the world. With that parable by way of introduction it's very nice in many ways to have your book, a book that you've written, have a 25th year celebration. Makes you feel old. But one of the questions that I obviously would like to put up front before I get to where we are now is, well, Mr. Harrington, you wrote this book. The President of the United States, in a very limited degree and partial response to this book, declared in the State of the Union message in January of 1964 an unconditional war on poverty. And did it make any difference at all? Did we do anything? And the answer is one that I think that might surprise many of you who have been brought up in the age of Ronald Reagan. The evidence is overwhelming and not to be disputed that every single program of the war on poverty succeeded. Every single program succeeded. Some very dramatically. We now know from a careful scientific study of Head Start, compensatory education for preschool poor children, that the children who got Head Start education in the middle 1960s, in the middle 1980s, are much less likely to be in prison, much less likely to be on welfare, much more likely to be working at a job than the children who didn't. If you understand that one of the great expenses of our society is putting poor people in jail, because the prisons of the United States are primarily for poor people and primarily for minorities. If you understand that that is a great expense, we made money on Head Start. And all the other programs succeeded, most not as dramatically as Head Start, they all succeeded. The fact of the matter is, looking back on the war on poverty of the 60s, that Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote, the real judgment on that war on poverty, he said, it was oversold and underfinanced to the point where its failure was almost a matter of design. To the degree that we failed, 
We failed because we didn't try. We spent very little money on the war on poverty. If you want to look at the federal budget of the United States, a document almost as unread as the Bible or Das Kapital, if you want to look at it and see where the money goes, you'll discover that means-tested programs for the poor are a tiny portion of the federal budget. The overwhelming bulk of the social spending in the federal budget goes to Social Security, Medicare, and retirement programs for people over 65, most of whom are not poor. We give more money to the middle class by yards in the United States than we do to the poor. And the failure of the war on poverty, to the extent it was a failure, was not that the programs didn't work, but that they never got the money they needed. And the other failure was that we fought the wrong war in Vietnam rather than the right war at home. So I make no apologies. We did reduce poverty in America through the war on poverty. Not enough. Most dramatically for the aging, we cut their poverty in half. In half. The aging used to be the poorest age group in the United States. By raising Social Security benefits, by indexing them, and by universalizing them, we reduced the poverty of the aging from about 33% to around 14%. I call that a success. By the way, we could do the same thing and eliminate the 14%. It's a snap. We don't even have to be intelligent. And among those 14%, one of the most grievously afflicted groups just happens to be very old women. There are more and more women in the United States living in their 80s and 90s, living miserable lives. But on balance, <coughs> the war on poverty, within the very great limits imposed on it, succeeded. But, and this is what I want to talk about this afternoon, there is a new poverty, more profound, more tenacious, more difficult to deal with than the poverty we faced in the 1960s. And what I want to focus on is that new poverty. In passing, I hope I will genuinely shock a few of you, because I will throw out a statistic here or a statistic there that might just possibly contradict what you think is the truth. All of my statistics, by the way, and they're debatable, but they're all taken from the federal government, almost all from the Bureau of the Census. Okay. What I want to do is, first of all, to define the new poverty, secondly, to examine its causes, and thirdly, to talk about what we might do about it. What I propose, what others propose. Definition. The new poverty isn't completely new. That is to say, the new poverty contains the old poverty. Uh, by the old poverty, I mean Appalachia was poor 25 years ago when the other America came out. Some things were done, they did some good things, but Appalachia is still very poor. One of my favorite handy-dandy indices to poverty to tell you if you want to become a poverty tourist, how you can always know you're entering a poor district, is as soon as the roads get lousy, look around uh, and you'll find out that you're in a poor area. As soon as you're on a two-lane highway instead of an eight-lane highway, the likelihood is you're in a poverty area. Go down to Appalachia and the lanes just narrow down to two and the potholes increase. Uh, the roads in the areas of the poor are rotten. They were in Appalachia 25 years ago. They still are. The minorities. The minorities in the United States are not the majority of the poor. Most poor people in the United States are white. Two-thirds of the poor people in the United States are white. Only, only one-third are black, but blacks are only 10, 11, 12 percent of the population. That is to say, blacks, minorities, are three times as poor as whites, which is outrageous, but poverty is not primarily or even exclusively, and certainly not exclusively, a problem of race. It has a strong racial component, but 
but it is an integrated problem. Blacks were poor 25 years ago. Hispanics were poor 25 years ago. They still are. So the old poverty is still there, but there is now a new poverty. What is it? Number one, very important, particularly in the last six, seven years, the poverty of working people. The statistics are this, federal statistics. Poverty in the United States in the 1960s went down consistently. Then starting in 1969, and I would like to blame everything, including the common cold, on Richard Nixon, but I can't honestly do it. It happened on his watch, but it was really not his fault, or it was only partly his fault. Starting in 1969, we stopped abolishing poverty. That is to say, the downtrend stopped, but poverty didn't increase. What it did from 1969 to 1978 was go up and down. And it went up and down in a very predictable rhythm. Every time there was a recession, it went up. Every time there was a recovery, it went down. And then starting in 1979, the population of the poor increased dramatically by one third in 1979. And the increase was almost exclusively among the working poor. Now, by the way, let me tell you very fairly what I mean. I don't mean that all of the working poor work full-time. Some of them only work part-time. But I mean people who work, who are poor because despite the fact that they work, and many of them do work full-time, the wages which they receive are not sufficient to lift them above, above the poverty line. Most of the new jobs in the United States, I'll come to back to this later on, most of the jobs that we have created in the last seven, eight, nine years are poverty jobs. The welfare poor, everybody in the United States is very uptight about the welfare poor. Most people don't know that the majority of the poor get no welfare. The welfare recipients that is to say, mainly the AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, mothers and their kids, are one-third of the poor. Two-thirds of the poor do not get any welfare. And you could abolish all welfare in the United States and there would still be millions of people who are poor. Moreover, there are more families headed by a working person who are poor, which are poor, than families headed by a welfare mother. So one of the most striking things about the poverty since 1979 is that it is not the poverty of the welfare poor, but the poverty of the working poor. Uh, and I, it, it, there are dramatic cases of this. I, for about the last oh, five, six years, have been going out to McKeesport, Pennsylvania, about every year and a half or so. Uh, it's right outside of Pittsburgh. It's a steel town. The mill has been taken down by now. When I first went there, there was the hulk of the mill. Now there's not even the hulk of the mill. The mill is, but they, they, they've dismantled it. And there you have steel workers who, when they worked full time, were making 28,000, 30,000 bucks a year. In steel, by the way, it was mainly men, only 20,000 women but with their wives working and making much less than they because this is a society in which the labor market is sexist. But with their wives working, that steel worker family might have had an income of $40,000, $45,000 a year. Not bad, right? Way above the median income. They thought they had it made. They called themselves middle class. Now they've lost their jobs. Some got new jobs. Most of them got new jobs that paid about 60% of the job they lost. So they didn't become poor, but they got pushed down. But a lot didn't get new jobs. Last time I was out there, I was talking to some steel workers, and I said, well, so what do people do who don't get a regular job? And they said, they pump gas. They deliver pizza. These are people who were union men, who had a sense of their dignity and their skill and a pride and their accomplishment within the system. 
And just like Jessica McClure, something else happens to those folks. When you lose your job in the United States, you lose your medical care. And when you lose your medical care, you don't only lose your medical care for yourself, you lose it for your family. And that means if you're one of those steel workers and you got kids and your kids get sick, what you usually do is you go to the ancient uh, stratagem of the poor, which is you take them, you wait till they get good and sick and take them to the emergency room. Most emergency rooms will not kick a kid with 106 degrees fever out in the cold. Although I don't want to make that a universal. I'm sure that there are some of the profit-making hospitals that do. Secondly, and related to the working poor, the new poverty is a poverty of children. Children are now, among the American poor, the poorest of the age groups. Our official poverty statistic, it's what, it's 13.4, I think it is, 13.4 percent. The poverty of children under six years, uh, under 16 years of age is around 20 percent. The poverty of children under six years of age is at about 24 percent. Who are those children? Are they the children of all those welfare mothers who are promiscuously having sex with irresponsible men and uh, the putting their kids, uh, well, this is all said ironically, you shall see when I get to it, imposing their kids on the system? No. They tend to be the children of the working poor. In this period, there has been no significant increase in the number of children on welfare. But there has been an enormous increase in the number of children who are poor. I assume that Jessica McClure's parents are not on welfare. We would have heard about it. But they're poor. Children. Third, the rural poor. And here are their two distinct groups. Uh, rural America, for a long time now, has been an area in which most farms lose money. About 80% of the farms in the United States lose money. And therefore, People who stayed in the countryside and stayed on the farm, what they did is they lived in the farm, on the farm, but they got a job in a plant that moved into a rural area to run away from unions in an urban area. Those jobs are now going with so many other jobs. So there is a new rural poverty of rural working people. And then at the same time, very much analogous to the steel workers and the auto workers who lose their jobs, there are the farmers who have lost their farms above all because we fought inflation with high interest rates. You'll hear people say on television from Taiwan, well, those farmers got what they deserved. They borrowed too much, they invested too much, they were dumb, so they lose. Tough, too bad, that's life, that's capitalism. The fact of the matter is they were mainly victimized by Paul Volcker and the Federal Reserve Bank, which dealt with the problem of inflation by sky-high interest rates and what is driving so many of these farmers off the farm, what is destroying those farm towns. You know the farm towns when, when you have a commercial that wants to make you feel good for aspirin or something like that? They show the people in that sweet little farm town where everybody knows everybody. You know what's happening in those sweet little farm towns? They're being shut down. Because when the farmers don't have any income, Main Street gets boarded up. There are hospitals which are being closed all over rural America right now because of this. There are farmers out in the Midwest today who qualify for and get food stamps. If you can imagine a greater irony, the people who had worked in the most productive agriculture in the history of humanity, American agriculture, have to, in order to feed themselves and their families, get food stamps. Fourth, there's a new poverty of the undocumented workers. <coughs> we don't know how many there are. Undocumented people don't want to be counted for obvious reasons. There is a new law. We don't yet know what effect that will have. We do know that in the period prior to the passage of that law, in every city, in the big city in the United States, sweatshops have emerged. The minimum wage law in the United States is not enforced. The minimum wage is ridiculously low to begin with. 
but then we don't enforce it. The minimum wage, by the way, is way under the poverty line. It's $3.35 an hour. A normal working year is considered 2,000 hours. That means the minimum wage is under $7,000 a year. According to the government statistics, a woman with one child needs more than $7,000 a year to live. And the four-person poverty family, which is the source of what we call the poverty line, that is now set by the government at about $11,000 plus. More than $4,000 higher than what the minimum wage yields. But the undocumented workers in the sweatshops don't even get the minimum wage. Now, I went and talked to some friends of mine in the International Lady Garment Workers Union. And they told of some black women out in Queens borough of Queens in Manhattan who were working in a sweatshop. They were from the West Indies, probably from Jamaica or Haiti. And not only was the boss paying them less than the minimum wage, he bounced checks on them. So they went to the union. And the union went out and talked to the boss, started yelling at him. And the boss said, oh, excuse me, you're right. It's terrible. I'll make it up right away. No problem. Just tell these women to show me their green card. At which point the women turned to the union people and said, get out. Because it's better to be exploited and have checks bounced on you than in, in New York than to go back to Haiti or to go back to Jamaica or what have you. Undocumented. Fifth, wherever I'm at, welfare mothers. Everybody knows about welfare mothers, right? We all know about these mainly black, lazy, promiscuous women who are living it up at our expense. Well, we don't, because we now know a lot more about them, and that image is totally at variance with reality. And here, I'm basing myself primarily on survey data developed by a very sophisticated study at the University of Michigan. It's what is called a longitudinal study. Let me explain this. It's technical, but it's worth a minute. The way the government normally defines poverty is it takes a given week in a year and it does a survey and it goes around and it checks how many people are poor, okay? And it comes up with 13.4%. And the year before it was 13.8, let's say, okay? And so next year you go back, you do the same thing, and you assume that if it was 13.8 and went to 13.4, you assume that what happened was four-tenths of a percent of the people who were poor got out of poverty, right? That's your assumption. But the fact is, it is possible that all of the people who were poor, all of the 13.8% got out of poverty, and that the new 13.4% are all people who are new to poverty, right? You can't tell that if you do the snapshots of the poverty population. What you need is a moving picture of the poverty population. The University of Michigan, for a whole series of uh, scholarly reasons, has a very sophisticated longitudinal study. That is to say, they take thousands of people and follow the same people year in and year out. And what this allows us, has allowed us to understand are a number of things. One, chronic poverty. People who are poor in nine years out of ten is way below our poverty figure. Okay? But periodic poverty, people who are poor in one or two years out of ten is much higher. We have a poverty figure right now of 13.4%. The Michigan data would suggest that only about 6-7% of the American people are poor in 9 years out of 10. Hooray! But that 25% of the American people are poor in 1 or 2 years out of 10. That's not so high. Now from that study we discovered something about welfare mothers. We discovered that, and Mary Jo Bain now at the Kennedy School has done the most brilliant analysis of this, we discovered that half of the welfare mothers in the United States go on welfare because a man deserts them and leave welfare in two years or less either by getting a job or remarrying. 
Well, that's not exactly your image of the lazy, promiscuous welfare mother, is it? Turns out that they got a lot of Max Weber Protestant ethic attitudes, contrary to our stereotype. And it also turns out that of the welfare mothers, another 25 or 30 percent get off of welfare in less than eight years. And that the number of welfare mothers who are chronic eight years or more is only 20 percent. By the way, this is not a left-wing statistic. The White House Committee on Low-Income Families uh, admitted this data in a report last December to President Reagan. So the fact of the matter is that welfare mothers are not lazy people, they're not promiscuous people. As a matter of fact, you know what the average size of the welfare AFDC family is? Two kids. That is to say, it is marginally higher than the average size of the American family. So the problem of welfare turns out to be more complicated uh, than we thought. Finally, in the new poverty. Another problem that we don't want to look at too closely, the homeless. Now, what do we think about the homeless? Well, most of the reportage on the homeless, most of our impressions about the homeless are sort of the crazy people, right? If you live in New York, you go to Grand Central Station, there are some spaced out people walking around in another world who are homeless. Some of them live in the tunnels of Grand Central Station at night when they close the station. And so what a lot of people have said, well, the homeless city is only the problem of the deinstitutionalized mental patients. That's all. Why we're not supposed to have compassion for deinstitutionalized mental patients, I've never understood. Leave that aside. The fact of the matter is, and here I'm quoting a, an analysis made by uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research last year, a very conservative analysis of the homeless. Two-thirds of the homeless have no mental or emotional problems at all. Two-thirds of the homeless are in families. Two-thirds of the homeless are young. And you know what their problem is? This is the one thing nobody in America wants to mention. You know what the problem with the homeless is? They don't have homes. They don't have housing. You see, that's tougher to face up to than mental patients, because that gets to be our fault, not their fault. And the fact of the matter is, in major cities in the United States, certainly including New York, but St. Louis where I grew up, San Francisco, all over the country, cities have been building and building and building the housing of the upper middle class and the rich, because they pay high taxes, and destroying the housing of the poor. And at the same time that that's been happening, the real income of the poor has been going down, so you have less of a supply of housing for a population which has less money to bid for it. That is to say, the problem of homelessness is not a problem of people's inner turmoil primarily, it is a problem of the economic and social structure of the society. So, I indicate number one, that there are groups of people who are the new poor, industrial workers, the working poor, children, the rural poor, the undocumented, the welfare mothers, the homeless. What are the causes? Now, a couple of years ago, there was a pernicious book by a charming man. Uh, the man's name is Charles Murray. Uh, the book was called Losing Ground. And Murray gave scientific expression to a myth believed in by every Yahoo in the United States. Uh, and what Murray said is, what is the cause of poverty? It is welfare. Ronald Reagan believes this to this second. But then this is a very old country club story that's been passed around for a half a century at least, which is when Reagan first heard it. Uh, why? We have given these people so much money, we have out of a mistaken benevolence treated them so well that we have made welfare more attractive than work. And what we have to do, therefore, is to abolish welfare and kick them in the rear and get them to work. And Murray's conclusion in his book is to abolish all the welfare programs in the United States. Murray is wrong. We know from the data I just gave you from the University of Michigan that fully half of the welfare mothers are not chronic at all, that only about 20% are chronic in any way, shape, or form. 
Secondly, Murray's argument is that this trend came online in the late 60s when the great society programs went into effect. But the fact of the matter is that the real value of welfare, AFDC plus Medicaid plus food stamps, has been going down since 1969. That is to say, Murray's premise is that we made welfare more attractive than work. The fact is that welfare, since 1969, every year, has become less attractive than work. So I don't buy that argument because it simply flies in the face of many too many facts. And if Murray is wrong, what is my explanation for what's going on? And my explanation is that we have a new poverty because this country is in the throes of a structural transformation more profound than any that has happened in a hundred years. And that it has been the source of the new poverty. Not the character of the poor, their lack of will, their lack of get up and go, but the structures of the society. What do I mean by that? I mean first and foremost something that I've already mentioned that the new jobs are poverty jobs. You say to a welfare mother, why don't you get out there and work? But the fact of the matter is, if you take into account that she is getting Medicaid and food stamps, that poverty jobs have no medical benefits or very few medical benefits, that you lose the Medicaid and the food stamps by taking the job, that the job is going to pay you less than $7,000 a year, that mother has to hate her children if she's going to go to work. Because going to work will mean that she will lower the living standard for herself and her family. And what I think is a major cause of poverty in the United States, what makes it so much more difficult, is all of these jobs, these low-paid kinds of jobs. In the 1960s, during the war on poverty, when we had economic growth, we could then talk about taking poor people and putting them into jobs in the automobile plants. We actually did it. The government had to pay the employers a subsidy to take the poor people, but they did. It worked. What about now? Now you can't put poor people into auto plants because auto plants are throwing <coughs> People out who maybe used to be poor but had made it and now they're being unmade uh, by the American uh, economy. So we are now in a society, the French sometimes call it the society at three speeds. An affluent yuppie top, not so affluent after the stock market in the last uh, 10, 12 days. An affluent yuppie top. A sliding middle whose income is going down, but not that dramatically. And the very tenacious 20% at the bottom who are in misery. And I say that that correlates very much with the labor market. Why is it that we have now had five years of economic recovery and poverty has hardly gone down at all? It's gone down. But by what? By about, not even by two points. In the 1960s, a five-year recovery period abolished much more poverty. And the reason is we're in a new economic world. Secondly, we're in a new economic world because we are now in an international economy, in an automated economy, in a computerized economy, in a way that we have never been before. And lots of people say, well, why don't the poor do what I did or what my father or my grandfather did? Why don't they get off their tail and go out there and work? But you can't get out of poverty that way anymore. When my grandfather was kicked out of Ireland by the police at the end of the 19th century and came to the United States, he was a great school dropout. And he was a smart, brawny Irishman who worked on the railroads for a while, laying track. 
wound up with a nice three-story house in St. Louis, Missouri as a member of the middle class. He was the American dream personified, right? It can't be done anymore. Take some black family which is driven off the land in the south and driven to a city in the north with an inferior education through no fault of their own and stick them in the northern labor market and tell them to do what my grandfather did. It's ridiculous because it's become impossible unless you're a very good professional football player, basketball player, or you can sing and dance well. Then you can do it, but uh, there are not too many who fit into that camp. We are in a new world. Now, related to this, and let me now take up an issue, which I'm afraid a, a well-intentioned but very misleading documentary by Bill Moyers on CBS uh, focused on. The issue of uh, babies having babies, wedlock birth, single mothers. Let me now lay on you a statistic which six will get you five will come as a distinct shock to almost all of you. The percentage of black young women who are single mothers has been going down for 20 years. Has been going down for 20 years. In the last 10 years, the percentage of white young women who are single mothers has gone up a bit. Well, what are you talking about, Harrington? It's going down? Well, why? You, you, are you saying all these people don't know what they're talking about? No. There's a great statistical confusion. The percentage of total black births to single mothers has gone way up. But you know why, mainly? because the percentage of married births has gone way down. It's not the rate of out-of-wedlock births which is shot sky high. It is that all women are having fewer children and the, a fairly stable percentage of single mother births become a much higher percentage of the total. We confuse the two. Okay? Now, but second, is there a problem with single mothers? Oh, absolutely. Because you see, 30, 40, 50 years ago, if a girl got pregnant, had a baby when she was 15 or 16, not married, she had already completed, roughly speaking, the education that the average person in the society was going to get. 50 years ago, most people didn't finish high school. Fifty years ago, you had a labor market in which people without high school diplomas could find jobs in good times. It is absolutely true that today, 15, 16-year-old girl in a ghetto becomes a mother. It's practically the end of her life in terms of what's going to happen to her, right? So I, I take it very seriously, but I want to calm down the figures. But secondly, I want to understand something about those figures. There's a marvelous new book that's just come out by the black sociologist William Julius Wilson, University of Chicago. The book is called The Truly Disadvantaged. And Wilson goes into this problem. He says, by the way, what I've just said about the rates and percentages. But he has some very fascinating data. And let me share it with you. Number one, black poverty in recent years has become much more bitter because it has become much more isolated. That is to say, in the United States, one of the racial differences in poverty is that the black poor are much more likely to live in a neighborhood which is predominantly poor than the white poor. The white poor tend to be more scattered in the society. The black poor in the last 20, 25 years have become more and more concentrated in poverty neighborhoods. Or put another way, in your ghetto neighborhood 25 years ago, there were lawyers and doctors and funeral directors and civil servants, letter carriers, etc. And there were poor people. And there were hookers. And there were numbers runners. And there were junkies. But now, says Wilson. Increasingly, the black poor live in a neighborhood in which there are no lawyer, doctors, funeral directors, civil servants, letter carriers, etc. There are only unemployed people. 
only broken families, etc. That is, that is not the fault of the individual. That relates to the kind of structural changes that I've been talking about. And then Wilson does something very interesting on the on the uh, these young black girls. He says, why don't they get married? And he asks a very good question. He says, how many people are there for them to marry? And he makes up an index, he computes an index of the number of marriageable males for young black women in poverty neighborhoods. And he discovers that for three reasons there are radically fewer marriageable men for young black women than for young white women. Reason number one is that the homicide rate among young blacks is incredibly higher than it is among whites. Homicide is the main cause of death among young black males. So some of the marriageable men are not there because they're dead. Number two, the prisons of the United States are, particularly in states which have large black population, black institutions. So another group of the men who should normally be there, so to speak, they're in jail. And number three, blacks are about 10, 11, 12 percent. We're not quite sure exactly what the figure is because we've never figured out how to count poor people yet. 11, 10, 11, 12 percent of the population, they're 27 percent of the armed forces. And therefore, Wilson's, and then fourth, the unemployment rate for young men in the ghetto is much higher. So if you look and you say, where is the possibility of what we like to call family life in the United States for these young black girls, the answer is, it is much less possible to them than it is to young white girls through no fault of their own. Indeed, Wilson makes the argument, which I completely agree with, that if we would have full employment in the United States, it would probably have a significant effect on birth to single mothers, particularly in the ghetto. Because it would increase the ratio of marriageable men by allowing some young black men to be economic as well as biological fathers. Uh, so, I'm saying then my account of the reasons for these changes uh, is an account based not on the fault of the poor, but on the transformations of the society. Finally, briefly, what are the solutions? Is the solution workfare? Everybody's now talking about workfare. If you're going to get welfare, by God, you're going to work, right? And that, that appeals to everybody. It appeals to liberals because we're going to give them jobs. And it appeals to conservatives because we're going to kick them in the tail. And that is a, the conservatives have always wanted to kick the poor. Uh, and here is a way to do it legally, fair and square. Liberals have always wanted jobs for the poor. Terrific. So it's a liberal conservative proposition. There's a problem. And I've already indicated to you what the problem is. 80% of the welfare mothers would go to work at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. We wouldn't have to pass any law. All we have to do, all, I put that in quotation marks, all we have to do is to have jobs for them with medical insurance and daycare that will allow them by working to actually increase their living standard. That's all. We don't have to have compulsion. Because you know what we're in danger of doing? We're in danger of moving women out of poverty welfare into poverty work. You could abolish all of the welfare in the United States and not change the poverty population by one. Is that good? And by the way, you can't do it because you know what's going to happen? You move a woman out of poverty welfare into poverty work, you know what's going to happen? She's going to come back to poverty welfare. Unless you want to go the Charles Murray route of absolute and principled cruelty. And secondly, for that 20% of the welfare mothers who are chronic, by the way, don't mistake me, I do think for some women on welfare, 
Welfare becomes a way of life, of course. All I say is it's a small minority. But for them, and it's usually not their fault, it's not enough simply to kick them in the tail. You're going to have to work with them. You're going to have to teach them to read and write. Uh, Ken Oletta did a book on the underclass some years ago about an experiment which tried to take hardcore poverty people and get them into jobs. And it cost a lot of money, and none of the workfare proponents want to spend a nickel. Moynihan's bill spends a ridiculously small amount of money. And Aletta's book found out, and how do, you, how do you describe this? What they did is they took people who were all junkies, ex-cons, ex-hookers, not middle class people in disguise, real poor people, okay? Underclass. By the way, the majority of the poor are not in the underclass. The underclass is maybe 20% of the poor. And you know what the success rate was or the failure rate? Take your choice, which you want to call it, 50%. After spending a lot of money, the problem with workfare is 80% of the mothers don't need it. And for the 20%, they need a lot more. But secondly, and more fundamental, I'm afraid that I have to tell you that we will never solve the problem of poverty in the United States if we do not solve the problem of this structural transformation of the entire society. Because it is no longer true that economic growth destroys poverty. It is no longer true, as John Kennedy said in the 1960s, and it wasn't even true then. But it is certainly not true now that a rising tide lifts all boats. The tide has been rising for five years and poverty has hardly been affected. That's the fact of the matter. I believe, and I happen to be a radical, but I'm not happy to say this because America's not radical and I don't think we're going to act on it very quickly, that we need much more fundamental transformations of the society than anybody is now talking about in mainstream politics. Possible exception of Jesse Jackson. That we need things like the planned reindustrialization of a good part of America. We need to utilize American labor power, not at poverty jobs. We have to utilize American labor power in creative jobs. We can't outcompete the third world at poverty wages. They will defeat us six ways to Sunday. They will pay lower wages than we will ever be able to tolerate without destroying our entire economy. The only way we can survive as a national economy in this new world is if we use our brains and the brains of our working people, including the brains of our poor people, who are not dumb, but who are people who have, by far and large, been victimized by circumstances totally beyond their control. I think we have to talk about planning. I think we have to talk about the 32-hour week. I think we have to talk not simply about American poverty, but about the poverty of the world. I don't want to create a perfect America in a starving world. Moreover, we can't. Ask the stock market. We now live in an international economy. When the stock market closes in San Francisco, it opens in Tokyo. And I believe one of the things that we have to look at is a world campaign to abolish poverty as a way of creating jobs here. If we focus on the poverty of Bangladesh, of Haiti, of Chad and Tanzania, if they had the funds to begin to modernize and change, we could be where many of the machines, the tractors, the tools that they would utilize to defeat their poverty would come from. I tell trade unionists whenever I talk at union meetings, which is as often as I can, you're wrong to think that the problem is the Mexican worker. You're wrong to think that the problem is the Taiwanese worker, the South Korean worker. The problem is a General Motors, which even now is importing automobiles made by South Korean workers into the United States under an American name and profiting off of workers who are paid low wages because they got a gun at their back. And it is in your interest 
if we could have not the priorities of the multinational corporations, but maybe, if I may say it, in a Catholic institution, the priorities of John the 23rd's encyclical Pachamenteris, if those were the priorities of the world economy, I think we would not only do justice to others, I think we would do justice to ourselves. Finally, let me conclude with two points about poverty. And what I've been saying, I'll be quite brief. Number one, I assume that most of you are from middle class families. And I want to say this to you. This is the practical argument. I'll close on the moral argument. Let me give you the practical argument. Don't think that I've been talking today about them. I've been talking about you. Because you see, all of you, all of you young people, all of you students in this auditorium, you're affected by these trends too. The world which is so cruelly dealing with the new poor isn't hurting you in that way, but it's going to shape your lives. If we don't settle the problem of poverty, you're going to live lives that are less rich than they might otherwise be. How many of you young people here are taking courses you don't want to take and preparing for lives that you don't want to lead? Because it's smart. How would you think if we began to consider work in American society, not just for the poor, but for everybody, and talk about trying to create a society of meaningful work for all, even for middle class people? Wouldn't it be of some value to you if you could spend your college days studying things which enrich your spirit? and your working lives in doing things which help transform you as well as the world. I think so. And I will guarantee you that we will not, so long as we let these trends which strike at the poor go on, they will strike at you more and more. And I'm sure if I had given this speech, what is it, two weeks ago Friday to an audience of yuppies on Wall Street, they would have said, pie in the sky, hot air, what's this guy talking about? And the next Monday they would have found out. We live in a very unstable world, and it is most unstable for the poor, but it's unstable for every one of us. And we better deal with these problems, not simply because of the poor, but because of all of us. And the second, that's the pragmatic argument. I don't want to close on that. I want to close on the moral argument. And here, I want to use the work of a philosopher by the name of Rawls. And I disagree with him on many things, but not on this point. Rawls has what he calls an intuitive definition of justice. And I think it's brilliant. Rawls says, a society is just if I describe it to you and you can accept it without knowing what your place is in it. Okay? Would anybody here accept as just a world in which so many people would be hungry and I would not tell you whether you would be born in Bangladesh or Haiti or Chad or the American middle class? Would any of you accept a world as just in which young people in the ghettos can have their lives blighted by the time they are 15 or 16 years of age? And I would not tell you whether or not you were going to be a young person in a ghetto. You couldn't. You'd be crazy to accept it. And if in your mind you could not accept a world in which we did unto you as we now do unto them. Isn't it time for us to change the way we are acting towards them who are part of us? Thank you.